Major funding for this program is made possible by grants from HSH Nordbank New York Branch and First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Perfect Building Maintenance, Greenberg Traurig LP, Allied Partners, The Moynian Group. Additional funding for this program is made possible by grants from Ann Terry's Real Estate, Arbor Realty Trust, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Essex Capital Partners, Fremont Investment and Loan, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Muss Development LLC, Rosenthal and Rosenthal Inc., Signature Bank, Stonehenge Partners, Swig Equities, The Engel Berman Group, The Wickhoff Group, Titan Capital, YL Real Estate Developers. Welcome to Building New York. My name is Michael Stoller. Forty-two years ago, a, uh, a guy is born in East Orange, New Jersey. Uh, his dad is in the mail order business, liquor wholesaler. He moves to Maplewood, New Jersey uh, from East Orange. After Maplewood, New Jersey, he goes to public high school and then goes to Hobart College. Allegedly, he's a tennis <laughs> player, but he goes to Hobart College, graduates at 21 years of age, and then what does he do? He becomes a, a, a eventually becomes a real estate leader. But I'm very happy today to have Erica Daw, president of Allied Partners, as my guest. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. So, Eric, you know, tell me, you know, we, when we met uh, a couple weeks ago, we were talking about your childhood. Your dad, uh, you were saying to me in your life. Uh, you've had a couple of mentors. One is your dad, one was your grandfather. And I, I'd like you to bring that up because I think your grandfather has a very interesting history. Yeah, well, I think that um, my father uh, learned a lot from my grandfather, and, and my father was certainly uh, my beacon in terms of a mentor as well. And, and my grandfather was Depression era mentality, essentially, um, was a dentist and a major jazz uh, fan, uh, ja a fan of jazz music. So. He was living in East Orange, and I think about in his mid 40s, uh, while and, and practicing dentistry as well as managing these jazz, jazz bands, um, came up with an idea uh, with respect to a loophole uh, which involved the duty-free uh, the ability to export and import liquor, tobacco, and souvenirs over the uh, U.S. Canadian border without uh, duty. And he opened up a string of these uh, duty-free stores um, with, uh, with ancillary gas stations on the U.S.-Canada border. It did very, very well. And um, ultimately, he sold out to you know, the current, uh, basically the monopoly. Uh, who owns all uh, these duty-free stores? Who owns uh, duty-free uh, so, so, so how does the, uh, you know, the grandson of this uh, entrepreneurial jazz, booker of jazz bands, go to Hobart College, and at that time you had no idea really what you wanted. I mean, one summer you worked, uh, you were cold caller for Shearson, you told me, right? Yeah, I was uh, trying to get my feet wet in the uh, stock market. I worked as a cold caller, uh, Shearson Lehman. I worked um, another summer for a uh, trader of commodities, the gold, uh, uh, gold pit. I was a, uh, a runner, so to speak, um, but not really exposed to real estate. And it was my father, in fact, who um, I guess summed it up by saying, you know, in an operating business, you're as good as your last hour in the office. Um, but you said, you know, during college, I think, or even high school, you, you, your dad had some of these pick and pay where he had garments and other things. He worked there also. Right. He had a very successful uh, direct marketing company um, um, for household goods and costume jewelry and so forth and um, had a major pick-and-pack operation on Lower Fifth Avenue and also in Maplewood, New Jersey at the same time. So I worked uh, for him as well and, and obviously contemplated uh, going into that business. So you're 21 and a half years of age. You say, I'm finished with Hobart, and you then decide to go to Columbia for your master's. 
And at Columbia, you concentrate on real estate. And I think during your the two-year program, you had this one year, this summer job with those uh, gentlemen, we would say. What was that? Uh, um, it, uh, a fellow named uh, uh, Richard Hyman and uh, Michael Zuckerman. Right, where you got a little taste of the, uh, the apple, as we would right. say. Right, it was a, a good learning experience, and again, um, uh, I just got, uh, took a shot and took a real estate introductory finance course, uh, really felt an affinity for it, and again, with prompting from my father that this was something I should focus on, um, I continued to do it, and I really ended up loving it, uh, just as a fluke. But you know, really. one of the interesting things that we spoke about was that one of your projects at Columbia, I think, was to evaluate, there was a building built, and this one, there's a lot of stories about it. Uh, it's called the- uh, America's uh, Tower. America's Tower, right. it's 1166 Avenue of the Americas, and uh, it was built, nobody really knew who the money was. Uh, some of it said it was from Marcos, which right. probably was, and it was the Bernstein brothers. And the question was, was there the feasibility in the mid-90s to construct this building? Because there was not a need. And then you, as a student, well, this was an interesting, this was a seminar class, which was involved in internship with the Bernstein brothers. Um, in fact, there was a fellow there, Murad Tabaz, I remember, I'll never forget, who was really the guy that was operationally uh, doing the development or the pre-development at the time. And, and we were asked uh, in summation of the seminar to provide our opinion as to whether the building should be built or not. And it was my opinion after doing basically a supply-demand analysis uh, based upon the major uh, industries, the fire, as they say, uh, financial, insurance, and real estate uh, industries in Manhattan as to how fast they were growing, based upon how many square feet each employee would need, 100 feet, 200 feet, whatever it is, and, and, and it showed a shockingly uh, clear uh, picture, in my opinion, that, the, that, that, that there was a major oversupply in, in terms of what was in the pipeline of spec office. And, and uh, I advise not to build it. Thank oh. Things happen. So oh. now you're 23. Uh, an opportunity comes up with the with Arthur Sonnenblick, Paul Stern, some other people, to join Sonnenblick Goldman. Right. And uh, for and this was a tough time in real estate. That's when I, I met you going back at that time. Sure. Um, and and you, you get involved at Sonnenblick, who was a legendary uh, really, at that time, they were more in mortgage financing and other aspects, and you get involved with a variety of things, uh, and you meet eventually one of your partners. Was a again um, the opportunities in, for graduating from business school were essentially going to Wall Street, becoming a consultant at one of the big consulting shops that was very popular, and uh, real estate, I guess, as the third thing, but really it wasn't uh, that popular relative to the other two. Um, so uh, again, coming out of the uh, result of this relationship with the New York land people, um, I got to Arthur Sonnenblick and he called up and inter we, we interviewed and I started about the month after graduation in 1989, doing essentially uh, going through uh, the army really, boot camp. It was uh, 360 days a year, you know, 12 hour days of uh, financial analysis, uh, kicking tires, and uh, working primarily on the sale of, and financing of, of investment, you know, major institutional assets. So, so 29 and a half years of age, I think it's 29, I'm not sure about that. You, you have the, uh, I don't want to say, you know, the chutzpah or the, the, the side that you and your, your colleague at Sonnenblick, Brad Reese, are going to go out and create an entity called Ally Partners. How, how do you come up with the name Ally Partners? I don't know. I mean, I, I, uh, I, I'm not great at names, but I, I, it popped into my mind. And um, the market at Sonnenblick really, well, at Sonnenblick really just fell off a cliff in 91 or whatever. And uh, it was like a ghost town there. I mean, everything just stopped on a dime. and. Uh, this fellow Brad Reese, who was a, uh, a broker at Sonnenblick, and I kept in touch, um, and we were trying to understand when the market was really ripe for uh, investing in opportunistic stuff. And that was in 93 that, uh, that we finally decided there's enough uh, right. grease but to but you, to you said to me that basically the first building, and then we'll talk about your partners, you know, everybody remembers their first building <laughs> they bought. The first building you bought was 
in the Alphabet City. Taxpayer on Avenue D in Houston, yes. Uh, and major tenants? <laughs> major tenants, a beeper store and a car service and a bodega. And um, basically we bought it to, for about a million uh, two with a, a seller paper of about 950000 So you put up uh, a quarter of a million dollars. Um, and it showed on the equity uh, a major cash-on-cash -cash return. Unfortunately, it showed on paper that way, but in reality, um, the tenants uh, paid uh, once in a while, or they paid half, or they gave you a story, and they didn't exactly uh, send a check with a with a with an invoice. Um, it was inv it involved having to go there and, and collect it. <laughs> right now, after that transaction, uh, it was really you know you, you said to me it was you and Brad were like a third. Right. Your your dad agreed to. Part, provide some equity, a third, and then the other third was uh, Larry Friedlander and Arnold Penna. Right. And, and the next transaction really was a major transaction for you guys when you t went to 545 Madison Avenue. What did you do over there? Well, that that was a uh, deal. I mean, essentially, the, the structure was that we were 50 percent, Arnold and Larry uh, were 50, uh, 25 each, and, and that was sort of the the uh, the the quid pro quo for my father to get comfortable. He wanted very seasoned professionals to invest behind and and take guidance from. And in fact, 545 Madison was a restructuring and typical in those days where you took over a limited partnership that was probably done for for tax uh, shelter, and they had a huge recapture. Um, and this involved keeping them in and and taking it over the LP position taking over the GP position simultaneously, and it was a leasehold, so it made it even more complicated, but uh, worked out very well. We got a good return, and that was sort of the beginning of our endeavor to try and find these complex deals. So, so then you go to Studio 54? Come on, <laughs> I, I know you you, you, uh. you, you like that, the, the, the hype, but so what happens with Studio 54? Well, it really was a market dictated by um, the extent to which the banks were willing to sell paper, and uh, it wasn't necessarily uh, commonplace. You know, we had Bank of Tokyo, which uh, loans on Studio 54 and a bunch of other properties, and they were uh, fairly quick to come Wait, to the but, table. You know, many people think when, and from my audience, Studio 54 was only a part of this component. Yeah. Studio 54 was, was the well, Schrager Rubel yeah. Club of the 80s. It was just a separate property, right. a theater. And then there was an office building. Right. And you you and bought this out of the bank. You bought it out right. of the note. And a simultaneous arrangement with the equity ownership to, again, keep them in place for tax reasons primarily, give them a back end interest. And that we did oftentimes because there was really no way uh, to efficiently buy a, a fee simple position. And, so, and what did you it. do over there? You took this place. Well, how do you restructure that? Well, uh, the theater was um, was uh, occupied by a tenant that had uh, defaulted and was in bankruptcy. Uh, the office building, I think, of 17 stories, had half uh, was half filled, and of the uh, eight or nine floors that were leased, about half of them were actually paying. So it was really um, a, a situation where we went in there and we rebranded the building. We gutted it. We we mark. We called it the Studio 54 building to try and trade off that name, and we uh, <clears throat> we targeted entertainment industry tenants because those were really the only one of the few segments of the market that were that were holding strong. Uh, we've got recording studios and uh, and you still own that building today? Yes, we do. Yes, and had air rights as well. Uh, that, that, right, and then you go downtown, 250 Church Street. Right. Same situation. I think this one uh, uh, was a Fuji Heller loan of I don't know. The ratio then was about uh, 28 million or so, and we bought it for I don't know three or four. I think. Do it you was. still own two two fifty? Yes, today? we still do. The, these were assets again that we um, put into trust and and hopefully will keep forever. You know, the great for the kids later on. Hopefully, right. Okay. Then I mean, then you. Then you go out to, you grew up in New Jersey, you didn't grow up in Long Island. Then you went out to Lawrence, Long Island, and you bought a shopping center, right? We bought a shopping center, we bought some apartments, some multifamily. Again, um, we were very anxious to identify uh, banks that were willing to sell loans, and whether we had, and the fee interest, uh, if, it, if it was held by somebody creative, we can work a deal out. Um, so it was more driven by uh, the availability of opportunities than it was by a particular target. And suddenly, I, I just heard you say you were looking at mm -hmm. banks who were selling loans. You now become a banker. 
You become a, you go out there and become a, as we would say, which I was at the same time. You became a hard money lender. Right. You were okay. charging fourteen and four or whatever, uh, that whatever, was, that was whatever the, the case. Kind of right. And you made loans on some very interesting properties, the Royalton Hotel. Yeah. Well, that one actually, um, we got to think of fee. We, we again, this was an interesting time because there was an institutional loan, I think, from First Boston that had been committed. But the ownership was concerned that they wouldn't fund because, again, it's a hotel loan in a market that was so skittish, that was just coming back. Look at the sign. And they so paid cool. us as a hard money lender a fee to stand behind the funding of that loan because it was critical based upon their ability to buy back the existing debt that they had the liquidity from First Boston. So that would have been the first hotel loan First Boston had made in years. So in the middle of this, while you're doing all this, suddenly, you and your partners decide to buy Brown Harris Stevens. How'd that happen? That uh, essentially came to us through uh, the Zeckendorfs, uh, Will and Arthur. Will had um, a decent relationship with Leona Helmsley, and the company was on Vanderbilt Avenue at the time and um, had a lot of liabilities in terms of litigation that was pending and so on. And we thought for the upside, the, the downside was, was manageable. Um, and we felt it would, A, would be a great platform in terms of infrastructure and so on. And it turned out to be one of our greatest uh, investments. But without, it was not, I, I did not anticipate the success of the company, that's for sure. Yeah, because Brown Harris is now Feathered Nest, Halston. Right. I mean, it's grown enormously. Yeah. Uh, um, then, you know, let's fast forward a little bit, I, because I have, I mean, you've done some, in, you, in your 42 years, you've done some very interesting deals. Why don't we now go over to um, 57th Street? I think, uh, is that, uh, you, you know, no, no, before we get to 57th Street, Brown Harris, you moved Brown Harris and, and you bought 770. Lexington, right. That's, right. Again, um, uh, it was a complex estate that owned uh, the fee. We bought part of the fee and the whole leasehold. And uh, it was about 50% rented, I think. And we put Brown Harris in. That was the big coup. We moved them out of Vanderbilt and put them in. in Good way to have a tenant. So we ended up with a relative, uh, basically fully uh, leased building. And it worked out great. Uh, we got the retail rented to a diesel uh, foreign uh, retailer. It worked out very well. Block from Bloomingdale's. We have Block from Bloomingdale's. And who would have known that right. uh, that that Lexington Avenue area became so so hot? Now, 285 Lafayette. Uh, that was a f an offshoot, interestingly enough, from our f 14 and 4 hard money uh, business. Uh, we were approached by the GP of the entity that owned the building, which was deteriorating to a point where it was about to collapse, and there were 10 existing artist families living there. And um, this fella had shown this opportunity to a number of potential hard money lenders, and I, I ended up saying, you know, we would do it, but not as a loan. It's too, too complicated. We would do it as an equity partner. Um, and he, even so, he, he went around and, and tried to offer it to others, other developers. Everybody passed, and I should have passed. I didn't know better. <laughs> but it was an extremely complicated uh, development where um, what I decided to do, instead of trying to evict or get vac vacant possession, was we brought the artists into our partnership. Um, and at the end, they contributed a nominal sum but got fee interest to their condominium units with, within a very highly... Uh, improved building. So. Now now you change, I mean, look at the city. You've been on Church Street, you've been on Lafayette. Now you go near Bryan Park. What do you do over there? 50 East uh, 42nd? That to me, park front, full 40th between 5th uh, and 6th, right dead center in the, in the, on the park. Uh, to me, it's, it's the, the analogy I would say is waterfront property for Manhattan. Uh, geographically, it's the epicenter. We, we bought a vacant uh, building uh, with air rights and land banked it uh, to a, a tenant who's uh, the Catherine Gibbs School. They're, they're still there. And uh, hopefully it'll be, in the near term, a, uh, I think one of, the, one of the great development sites in the hey, city. Hey, look, I mean, right next door, the hotel's done great. You know, yeah. Everything in Bryan Park has done really great. Now, now we're going to fast forward to the, to the time. Y your dad was uh, studying martial arts? Yes, in fact. A and uh, he meets somebody and... Uh, while he's studying martial arts and tells you about a building because 57th Street and, and 
Everybody knows 57th Street and 5th Avenue, but 57th Street and 5th Avenue in 2000 wasn't the 57th Street today. Uh, you know, right. It was in transition. It was in transition. That. It was my favorite store was there. I hate to say it. I, <laughs> I liked the Warner store. I always liked Bugs yeah. Bunny and all the rest. Uh, you know, and and what, what happens now? Tell, us, tell me well, what that, happens. That, that, That's that the corner of 57th and Right. 5th. It's the northeast corner. It uh, was occupied by Warner Brothers Studio Store that show, sold the stuffed animals and so forth with the big Superman elevator. Um, the Warner had a 25-year lease, include, you know, inclusive of options, and uh, it was at a, a return that would have been extremely low if we would have bought the building at the price. This fella was a broker who introduced us to the contract vendee um, who didn't want to own it. He, he sold the contract to us, and um, the seller was a Japanese life company. And make a long story short, we looked at the operation, and my father was integral in this, and he felt that they weren't selling much and that they couldn't afford the rent, irrespective of the fact that it was relatively low. So sure enough, we sat down and had discussions with the, uh, with the tenant, which was Warner Brothers. They just merged with AOL. They were closing other studio stores around the country, and um, we ended up, they demanded a, a multi-million dollar buyout. We ended up, you know, they paid us, in fact, to leave. So it worked out great. And uh, just as that uh, was happening, the, the area was being, uh, you know, the whole, con you know, the whole nature of that neighborhood was changing from, from middle market to high end. And uh, the Coca-Cola store and the Disney store and all these kinds of things were being overshadowed by the high end luxury retailers. And so how do you get LVMH? Well, it was. It became uh, amazingly the target of a, a, a an incredibly, co uh, com, you know, a c competitive bidding uh, thing. E even though we weren't officially on the market, we had Gucci, we had LVMH. You know, they were battling each other. Uh, Pino from Gucci and uh, Arno from LVMH were extremely competitive in Paris, where their headquarters are. And I think one side got the information that the other was going to try and lease it or buy it, and it just became this whole uh, rabid uh, chase. And we ended up um, really not wanting to sell it. That's the irony. We really wanted to lease it. And unfortunately, the European concept is they don't like to lease. They like to own. But the price was so compelling that we felt... Uh, Never probably, fall in love with real estate. You know, it, it was a... No, uh, look, the location is probably a quadruple A, but... Uh, this provided liquidity. I mean, a tremendous yeah, liquidity. Yeah, pr provided liquidity. It also did another thing. Didn't that help you go to your next asset? Right, right. Because by uh, the, even at, even at that time, I didn't have a lot of liquidity. I was very, very. Uh, yeah, but the other supported. asset is interesting. I mean, yeah. how, how do you find? I mean, he is the guy from Maplewood, New Jersey, <laughs> who owns a corner on Fifty Seventh and Fifth, and now he gets the famed Citigroup building. Again, you know, opportunistic. Uh, also on Lexington Avenue. Right. Well, Lexington. 54th Street's been great, too. Right. But um, in terms of the, of the uh, sale of 57th Street and the huge gain, it was, uh, it was, um, it was obviously in critical that we found an exchange opportunity. Um, and uh, just before the Christmas uh, New Year's vacation in 2000, I um, was approached as a a lark on a lark by a, a broker, uh, Woody Heller was at Studley at the time. Um, uh, yes, the, uh, Jones Lang, pardon Jones. me. And um, I said, you know, it could be uh, something of interest. So Cooper Horowitz, Richard Horowitz, and I had this pipe dream, which uh, <laughs> which started to gain momentum. Every week, the odds went from half of one percent to three quarters of one percent. <laughs> And I started to spend money on due diligence uh, without having a contract. And one thing led to the other, and everybody returned back from vacation on the third, second or third of January of '01. And here I was, having done all my work and uh, and committed to uh, to buy the building on a preemptive deal. So you preempted, and how did you find Boston Properties? Because it was you and Boston who subsequently bought the right. building. Right. So what happened was, um, as it as it turned out. Um, Boston Properties provided a very attractive structure with the regard to their REIT, um, and it made sense uh, financially. Up and and, and uh, Yes, yeah, so I upreaded it with them, and it worked out phenomenally well. And uh, you kept that until uh, last year, right? Yeah, 
mid last year, right? Right, mid last year. But in between, you know, there was, uh, I mean, you had, the, you had the loan on the Hotel Empire, and you also built a, yeah, everybody knows about Woodbury Commons, <laughs> and uh, you built a shopping center up in Woodbury. Yeah, we, again, uh, looking at location, we uh, bought 68 acres or so right across from Woodbury Commons in uh, Woodbury, New York, and did a power center. Uh, a little lifestyle slash power center with Kohl's, uh, uh, Staples, linens and things, Pier One, Michael's Crafts, and it rented up very well. And we sold off a hotel parcel that, as well, and just closed on the sale of the asset to Kimco uh, two months ago or so. So that worked out great. And uh, you know, again, I'm not a retailer, so to me that was not that was a, the most. Good. That's why I'm not putting on my retail. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So anyway, so we, we, we sold that, uh, in fr frankly, because I didn't think it was, it was our right, core Right, but business. then you told me that you're, you're thinking of redeveloping your Long Island shopping center, right? Not that one. I'm thinking of doing the uh, Long Island housing, multifamily. Um, you know, it's a two-story, uh, 1950s classic red brick garden apartment complex, which I think can be, uh, in, we can increase the density and go to a mid-rise. But, but the interesting thing that you said is, Three years ago, something came up. What happened in your life? Uh, well, that was a very, it was a wake-up call. I, again, would, wor was working uh, ever since the Sonnenblick, you know, days. Uh, I knew no other way than full uh, throttle. And I had a very scary uh, medical. I had a benign tumor in my, in my, under my brain, which really shocked me. You know, it took me aback, but it turned out to be fine. Thank God. But the message was pretty clear that I got to start to live life a little bit more balanced. Right. And living life, you know, coming to my studio today, one of the best things is that I saw your life. I saw uh, your, your seven year old uh, Anna. My, my favorite okay. assets in, in, in And your other favorite asset, mm -hmm. your, uh, your four Ivan. year old Ivan, Ivan right. uh, who's sitting in the studio uh, and enjoying themselves. The question, you know, that I, that I say is, uh, you know, your mentors in your life have been Grandpa, your father, and probably Arnold and... And Larry, no LA. doubt. I mean, I credit them with uh, real estate uh, acumen. And uh, one day, would you like to see uh, Anna and Ivan, or uh, you'll let them... Uh... <laughs> you know, it's, it's a hard question. Obviously, uh, they'll inherit uh, most of this stuff anyway, but um, I just want, really want them to do what they enjoy. Um, and who knows? I mean, it's, it's certainly going to be a decision they'll make without the, the pressure from me. Right. Uh, but um, certainly it's been great, you know, and, and they'll, st I guess, they're too young, but they'll start to uh, hopefully become inquisitive. But, but you've been enjoying uh, being in the real estate business. You know, ah, it's the best. You, 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 you didn't make an error when you went to Columbia and finally decided that one day uh, the buildings in the world would change a little bit in New York. Listen, you never know. The, only, the way I try to think of things is you, you've got to accept uh, information like a sponge as best as you can and learn always. And two, you want to position yourself to be able to take advantage of opportunities as best as you can. And that's sort of what I've done. I, I, it's, it's, it's a lot more being in the right place, I think, and knowing what to do with the opportunity than it is to say, I've got a vision of where the market will be and I'm going to place a big you know, chunk of change on a bet. Real estate is location, 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 and timing. And if, it, if you hold it long enough, it'll and, take... And good partners. And great partners. I'm really happy that I've been able to have you because you all truly are a builder in New York. Thank, Thank you, you, Michael, so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Major funding for this program is made possible by grants from HSH Nordbank New York Branch and First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Perfect Building Maintenance, Greenberg Traurig LP, Allied Partners, The Moynian Group.
Additional funding for this program is made possible by grants from Ann Terry's Real Estate, Arbor Realty Trust, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Essex Capital Partners, Fremont Investment and Loan, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Muss Development LLC, Rosenthal and Rosenthal Inc., Signature Bank, Stonehenge Partners, Swig Equities, The Engel Berman Group, The Wickhoff Group, Titan Capital, YL Real Estate Developers.